In this video, I will talk about microfabrication processes. Previous video was about uh, materials and, uh, and clean rooms in general. This will go into the details about uh, processes. We will talk about additive processes that add additional layers, subtractive processes that remove layers, photolithography and liftoff, which uh, are very commonly used in our field, and soft lithography for, uh, for forming PDMS chips. So a uh, comparison between uh, additive and subtractive processes. You don't just have to associate to microfabrication. 3D printing is also an additive manufacturing process. It doesn't necessarily have to do anything with uh, microfabrication. Just uh, so that you see an example from another world, uh, yes, 3D printing is an additive manufacturing process. Keep that in mind. There are various types of uh, 3D printing methods. We have talked about them in a previous video. Layer deposition in terms of microfabrication is an additive process. You can do it with uh, vapor phase deposition, so from gas to solid. You can also do it with uh, liquid phase deposition, so liquid to solid. And we will talk about uh, these methods. And this mostly means uh, depositing thin films, so thin layers. Subtractive processes means you remove material. Surface micromachining would mean you work on the surface. So you work on the level of the thin films that you deposited. You have deposited them, now you must micromachine them. You do something to them. We will see what you can do. Bulk micromachining means that uh, you do not work in the layer of thin films, you work in the bulk, which, means, which is uh, silicon or glass in our case. So if you etch into uh, the, the silicon, that's bulk micromachining. Uh, in terms of, uh, of additive processes, this is our tool uh, library, let's put it that way, or this is the arsenal that we can work with, but we will only focus on the ones that uh, are relevant to biomems. We will not uh, talk about any other. Now, uh, first about uh, some physical vapor deposition methods. Thermal oxidation is something that uh, happens nearly every time if you make something and uh, how it works is um, you have a furnace into which uh, you add oxygen and you burn hydrogen and your wafers are uh, oxidized. Uh, basically, the, the oxygen molecules just, just deposit onto the or diffuse into your uh, silicon uh, crystal lattice in the top layers. So doesn't reach uh, deep inside. And uh, what you get is a high temperature oxide layer. So in your furnace, there's a, a really high temperature, 800 to, 100, uh, to 1200 uh, degrees Celsius. And uh, it's possible to do with, uh, with water, also possible to do with just oxygen. By water, I mean water vapor. And uh, hydrochloric uh, acid can also be added to, uh, to improve the yield. Um, evaporation, that's another uh, physical vapor deposition method in which uh, you uh, heat up your source material in a crucible, being a, a thermally resistant uh, pot, basically. And uh, this is done in vacuum and uh, your heated material evaporates into this uh, enclosure and deposits onto your sample. Sputtering. Uh, sputtering is the effect of uh, ejecting microparticles uh, from a solid surface upon bombardment with a high energy plasma or gas. And uh, what happens uh, in uh, sputtering deposition, which we will talk about, we will not just talk about sputtering, but sputtering deposition, 
is uh, that it's it's not just regular sputtering; it's re-sputtering. So you uh, you have a target which uh, you bombard with a high energy gas, typically argon ions or ionized argon gas. Inside your sputtering chamber, there's a gas intake and then uh, your ions are uh, coming and uh, eating away at uh, your target surface. And uh, there's a release of uh, microparticles that uh, will deposit onto your uh, substrate where uh, you will have a growth of, uh, of a thin film. And uh, the sputtering gas is always an inert gas, which is uh, uh, energized to, to typically to become plasma. And uh, it erodes material from the target and deposits onto the substrate. And that's how you can uh, grow a thin film, for instance. Now, uh, you can also deposit from the liquid phase. This is more accessible. A spin coater doesn't cost too much. It costs a couple thousand euros to buy a good one. Um, and we will not talk about deep coating, we talk about spin coating only. So in this case, you attach your uh, wafer to a vacuum chuck and spin it at a very high speed. Uh, speed being, uh, in our case, in, with this machine, can go up to 12,000 12, revolutions per minute. And from a dispenser, you dispense your liquid phase material in the middle of the wafer. And as it is spinning, centrifugal forces will uh, just distribute the material evenly. And we'll, you will have a, a very uniform cover, a highly uniform, not very, but highly uniform coverage of, uh, of a layer on your uh, uh, substrate. And uh, this is the way to, uh, to deposit, for instance, Teflon from a liquid phase. Uh, but it is also the way to, to deposit uh, photoresist, which we will talk about later, what that is. Uh, chemical vapor deposition. That is another method of, uh, of uh, depositing from a liquid phase. It is typically done in vacuum and uh, it produces high quality thin films. So uh, in this case, it's done in a furnace and uh, the wafers are placed inside this vacuum chamber where uh, again, you feed your material and uh, it is deposited onto these wafers. So your material is, uh, is deposited onto these wafers. Now, uh, moving on to subtractive processes. Uh, this is the arsenal. And again, we will not talk about the ones that are not so relevant to uh, biomems. We'll only focus on the ones that are used very commonly. Uh, all of the ones that uh, I have also encountered uh, during my practice up to this point. So, uh, first we talk about glow discharge methods, plasma etching and reactive ion etching. The setup looks like this. We have uh, two electrodes which create uh, a uniform electric field and uh, accelerate ions, charged ions, uh, towards your uh, uh, target surface. And as the ions bombard the surface, so you have your etchant chemicals, as they approach the surface, they are absorbed. So this would be your uh, material that you want to etch. There is a reaction, so etching happens. Then uh, the, there's a desorption of uh, the etchant and the, the substrate being etched away or the thin film that you want to uh, micromachine and it diffuses back into uh, gas. Another way is uh, with ion beams. Uh, in, in the case of uh, ion beams, you have a focused stream of uh, ions such as uh, gallium, 
which uh, attacks your sample and uh, and etches into it in a specific spot. Uh, it can be used for ion beam milling. So instead of having a drill, in this case, you have a particle stream that uh, bombards your surface and eats away uh, from it. This way you can uh, make very high resolution structures. And uh, there are uh, other ways with, uh, with additional gases, you can add uh, uh, some additional gas to, to speed up the etching process. Um, and then you need to also neutralize that, uh, neutralize the charges. Deep reactive ion etching, this is really important. So to make uh, high quality, high aspect ratio microstructures, uh, this is very necessary. Normally, how etching happens is uh, if you add the reactive chemical that uh, that will etch in every direction uniformly. So again, I have used this word before. Um, isotropic means, so isotropic etching means that uh, you etch at the same rate in every direction. So your reaction happens at the same rate in every direction. It is um, affected by your crystal structure. Again, not part of this lecture. Etching rates are affected by uh, your crystal structure, crystal orientations. Um, I am not a chemist, so I do not think uh, I could give a very good explanation to this. But if it is interesting to you, then uh, by all means check it out. This is another way uh, of uh, achieving an isotropic etching. An isotropic would mean that it doesn't happen at the same rate in every direction. So here we have a masking layer, a photoresist, for instance, which uh, protects your uh, material. And you have an etchant gas that isotropically etches. So it, it, it just etches everywhere uh, the same way, same speed. And um, it also attacks the walls of, uh, of your uh, bulk material. So there would be under etching. Normally, if you do this, just etch into the surface, then eventually your etchant will start eating away uh, from the side walls and uh, you will have under etching and you will not get uh, a very uh, nice uh, straight side wall. But if you apply uh, a protective layer, uh, uh, usually fluorocarbon, uh, which is called uh, passivation. So after a, an etching step, you have another step of uh, passivation and you protect the side walls, then you etch again. Then you will have a different etching rate. Downwards, where it's unprotected, it will be faster. Sideways, uh, it will be slower. So you can get a very straight side wall. And uh, this is the way we can make very nice micro pillars which is, by the way, if you remember how we made our uh, super hydrophobic surfaces, was done by this process. So several steps repeating. Step one, etching. Step two, passivation. And then again, etching. Repeated again and again for a certain time and uh, with a certain uh, material. Now, uh, chemical etching or wet etching. Previously, we talked about dry etching. Now we talk about wet etching, where you add a liquid etchant, so a chemical that uh, eats into your uh, um, material. Typically, it is done by aggressive chemicals, such as sodium or potassium hydroxide, hydrofluoric acid, and so on. These are all really dangerous, so if you ever have to work with them, make sure to wear proper protective equipment and follow all the protective instru or safety instructions because uh, you are putting yourself at, uh, at a serious health risk if you don't. There must also be uh, a good air filtration in the room. So the liquid etchant eats away at your uh, uh, surface at the same speed every direction. So here you already see there is under etching. But this can be compensated somewhat by, uh, by knowing uh, how to work with uh, 
with crystal lattices and uh, some you can develop anisotropic etching uh, uh, by uh, by by knowing uh, the the crystal structures and uh, and uh, the etching rates along those uh, structures so yeah i have uh, already explained this but uh, just to to see again this is photoresist and i will tell you what it is later uh, Isotropic etching means that uh, it is at the same rate in every direction and uh, then if you're not careful you can get under etching and uh, you can get uh, not very straight sidewalls. An isotropic etching doesn't have the same rate in every direction so if you have an isotropic etching uh, such as uh, deep reactive ion etching you can get a very straight sidewall. Photoresist is a, a photosensitive polymer there are two types, positive and negative. Uh, depending on, on which type it is, it either solidifies or uh, becomes uh, soluble, or becomes soluble or insoluble, depending on the, the treatment with uh, a certain wavelength of light. And uh, it can be used uh, as a protective layer for, uh, for etching, for instance. But there are other uses as well, and we will get to that. So the, to, to compare uh, the results, this is deep reactive ion etching. You can get such a nice uh, uh, structure uh, with uh, deep reactive ion etching. And if you zoom in, the side walls are like this, quite uh, straight, uh, and the uh, aspect ratio is, is quite high. And is anisotropic wet etching, so using liquid uh, chemicals to, uh, to etch away at your uh, surface. If the crystal structure is uh, defined in a way that uh, that etching does not happen at the same rate in every direction and uh, and and well you know your chemistry then you can achieve something like this to to move on to uh, bonding so you will need to seal your chip when it is done and uh, there are different bonding methods so you have two halves one half uh, has the microchannels uh, as a negative, the other half is a sealing layer. And uh, you can use direct bonding. So um, with uh, silicon and glass, there can be uh, anodic bonding. In any case, uh, what you need to achieve is uh, secondary uh, bonds, hydrogen bonds between the, the two layers of your material. And you can do it in uh, various ways. In this case, uh, with uh, with ionizing the the surfaces and uh, and creating these uh, interactions by um, applying uh, an electric field, then um, you can uh, bond them together quite nicely. Uh, in other materials, uh, you can use an intermediate adhesive layer such as uh, thermoplastics or, uh, or you can do also solvent bonding. In any case, uh, you need to fill up the small gaps or uh, small grooves uh, between these different layers. You can fill it up with uh, another plastic. You can fill it uh, up by eating away at uh, these, um, these uh, different uh, uh, grooves on the surface and then joining the two sides. And you can just use good old glue that uh, basically does the same thing as uh, thermoplastics. Welding is, uh, is another way. Welding would mean that uh, you heat the surfaces up and, uh, and uh, basically melt them together, uh, to, to put it like that. The end result will look quite similar to this, even though this is another method, this would be anodic bonding, but uh, this one is, uh, is a similar picture as to what you get with uh, welding. Um, welding can be done in different ways. Uh, laser welding would mean that you use a laser beam to, uh, good for polymers, I, I must say, so in this case, uh, you basically uh, melt the layers together, melt uh, the plastic layers, for instance, together with a laser beam. 
Ultrasonic welding would mean uh, using friction to generate the same effect. And uh, diffusion welding is another thing used in uh, the microelectronics uh, industry. Not so much typical in uh, lab on a chip. Um, so photolithography, what it does and, uh, and how it works. Photolithography can be used uh, to selectively uh, etch uh, different thin films, such as oxide layers. And to perform it, you need something called a photomask, which has uh, windows that are um, either covered up or opened up to, uh, to light, to which the uh, photosensitive polymer, the resist, is uh, sensitive to. And Photoresist, as I said before, is a light-sensitive material. Positive becomes soluble where you point the light on it, and negative becomes insoluble where you point the light on it. So this is how, according to which you need to design your mask, so that uh, for positive resist and negative resist, you need the opposite uh, kind of pattern, but the pattern defines uh, where the, the resist is exposed to the light that you use and um, this is all defined uh, in the recipe uh, that, that you, you buy a, a polymer, uh, a photoresist, then you get the recipe of uh, what wavelength it needs to be exposed to and, uh, and all the other instructions. Um, we will go over just um, a process of creating a master mold for microfluidics, because in our case, that's the most interesting. So with this technology, with photoresists, you can create um, uh, a master mold for making microfluidic channels uh, to pour your uh, soft elastomer onto it, BDMS. You will see how that's done uh, in the next slide. Uh, with, with photolithography, you can create uh, this master mold from, uh, from photoresist. And how that happens is you uh, start with your wafer, which uh, it's, it typically has a thin oxide layer anyway, whatever you do, because it's uh, kept in air. You apply your photoresist, usually by spin coating. So first step would be cleaning and preparation, then application of uh, photoresist by spin coating. And there is a pre-baking step at uh, 90 to 100 degrees for 30 to 60 seconds. And this one is uh, for a typical uh, setup, typical recipe. So there might be other uh, photoresists with uh, different requirements, but uh, the, the pre-baking is short. It just uh, helps keep uh, the, the, the resist in place and, uh, and ready for the next step, which is aligning the photomask. So photomask itself uh, is typically glass chromium. The chromium is also uh, selectively patterned with, with micro-machining. So you have, this is a photo mask. And uh, you need to align it onto your wafer. And uh, that will be how you expose your photoresist in the next step. So you expose to UV light. And uh, depending on uh, whether it is positive or negative resist, it will become soluble or insoluble where you expose it. The covered areas are uh, unaffected, or yeah, they are they are unaffected by uh, by the light. Then, um, so mask alignment, exposure to UV. Then there is a post exposure bake at a higher temperature. This is also called hard bake. So uh, pre baking is soft bake. This is the hard bake at 120 to 180 degrees Celsius for uh, 20 to 30 minutes. And then uh, the soluble resist is washed away by uh, the solvent that uh, belongs to this uh, resist. And uh, after that, you can etch away um, if that is what you want to do. But uh, in this case, let's just focus on that you have your resist and uh, no etching, just removing the rest of the resist. So you have your 
uh, master uh, mold created from the photoresist that you will use later, you wash away uh, the rest of the, the unnecessary resist. And um, before we move on to uh, soft lithography, let's talk about another process. The, the way to deposit metal layers, for instance, so-called lift-off process. Um, and what that means is, uh, you will see from the steps, uh, you prepare your substrate, so you clean your uh, silicon wafer, and uh, you deposit your sacrificial layer. Sacrificial means that uh, it is used for machining and, uh, and nothing else. So um, uh, it can also be called a stencil layer. So now we are here. Then uh, you pattern the sacrificial layer by uh, etching, can be for instance uh, chemical etching, and uh, you create the inverse pattern of uh, what you want to get. Then you deposit your target material, for instance aluminium, and it goes uh, onto your substrate, but it also goes on your sacrificial layer. Sacrificial layer can also be a photoresist, uh, for instance. And uh, then you wash away or remove otherwise the sacrificial layer and with it the deposited material. And what remains is the pattern that you wanted. And here you need to see that if you start depositing from a liquid or vapor phase, it will go everywhere uniformly. That is why we need such a complex process to get to this pattern. It's not like in the macroscopic world. This is a microscopic world and uh, things are tricky. So if I uh, use a physical vapor deposition of, uh, of a metal, it goes everywhere at the same rate. And uh, it will equally coat the areas that I don't want to be coated. That's why it's, uh, it's needed to be like this. And the layers we have here numbered are the substrate, the sacrificial layer and the target material. This is mostly used uh, to create metallic interconnects, so wires. It can also be used to make electrodes. Then uh, now we have arrived at uh, soft lithography. So recall uh, the photolithography. We have created our uh, lithography mask in the previous uh, uh, step. Typically what is used is SU8, which is a negative resist. And um, it's a thick resist, so it can go up to quite uh, high layers, quite uh, thick layers. And uh, it can be used for molding uh, PDMS, which you have heard about uh, previously. So uh, it also doesn't need a clean room, which is a big advantage. So the instrumentation cost is, uh, is lower than uh, for other methods. You can... Uh, get away with 50 to 100,000 to get started. It needs a spin coater, hot plate, mask aligner, or laser direct uh, imaging system, where uh, a laser beam selectively cures your uh, resist or makes it uh, uh, soluble or insoluble, depending on what type of resist you use. Uh, it doesn't need a mask, LDI. It's also more expensive than just a mask aligner. So with uh, laser direct imaging, you don't need a mask. But we will talk about uh, the typical situation where you use a mask to uh, expose your uh, resist. And, and this method can produce uh, uh, structures with good aspect ratios. The, the disadvantage is that uh, your quality is lower than with silicon and uh, the mold lifetime is also lower than, uh, than if you would uh, uh, bulk machine. Yes, and the silicon glass and glass, uh, glass chips are far more robust than uh, PDMS glass. So this process we have already talked about, uh, but what happens afterwards? So you have your mask with your uh, structure, your master. Uh, so this would be your master. What you do next is uh, you put it in a Petri dish you mix your uh, PDMS uh, soft elastomer and you pour it on. 
and then what you get is here's your uh, silicon wafer and here's your structure and you pour on your uh, uh, liquid uh, silicon or silicon, uh, PDMS silicon and um, usually you have to apply a vacuum to remove all the, 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 the air uh, bubbles and then you need to wait a certain time or apply uh, heat to uh, speed up the curing process. Anyway, the PDMS cures, monomer uh, joins up into a polymer chain and becomes uh, your PDMS, uh, your solid PDMS. Um, and what you do then is you remove it and inside your uh, PDMS will be the negative of uh, your structure. And then what you do is you uh, activate the surface of your polymer with oxygen plasma and you take glass slide, which you also activate with oxygen plasma. And then you just join them together. And there you go. You have your microfluidic chip. So this is the typical way almost everyone makes microfluidic chips. And this is how we get PDMS uh, glass chips. However, in the labs, in our labs, uh, you will learn about uh, 3D printing uh, microfluidic chips, which is uh, something a bit more novel and uh, a bit more unique. So um, to, to talk a bit about uh, silicon glass and glass glass chips, uh, one or both sides, so remember we have one side with the channel, the other one is typically the ceiling layer, but the other one can also be patterned. So one or both sides are structured with, uh, with micro-machining and then the two sides are bonded, bonded together. Advantages are a very high aspect ratio, possibility to integrate electronics, excellent process control. On the other hand, this advantage is the sizable initial investment and it only makes sense in uh, professional use. It is not likely to be used in a consumer market. But they can also be combined with polymers, both silicon and glass. So in this uh, slideshow, I talked about uh, different microfabrication processes, additive processes, subtractive processes, and soft lithography. Thank you.